Thanks again for coming. And um, we'll start off by introducing Shane. He has uh, developed, well, Des Moines University developed the um, Human Performance Lab and the Running Cycling Clinic um, in 2001 with the running with Dr. Heiderscheidt. And then Shane has been with us since 2003, 2002. December. December of 2002. And uh, then added the cycling component to that in 2005. So he um, has a lot of knowledge about uh, the running related injuries and would like to share that with all of you and I'm sure uh, we'll have time for questions at the end as well but so I'd like to introduce Shane and he can give a further introduction of himself. If you Thank you. Well welcome everyone. Um, as Carrie said we spent a little time talking about uh, risk factors primarily associated with running related injuries and then we'll talk a little bit about treatment. Of course we've only got about an hour together so it's really hard to talk about all of the various injuries that are involved with running and the specific treatments they're up but we'll talk about treatment in general primarily focusing on conservative treatment. Things that myself as a physical therapist might work on in the rehabilitative type setting and bringing runners back from injury. And we'll talk uh, firstly about then the risk factors that are associated with it. And in doing so, there's a lot of information out there regarding risk factors or things that might be associated with injury, uh, 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 injury regarding to uh, running. Um, and along with that come a lot of myths too. So we're gonna to try to stick to the evidence that pertains to factors that have really been shown by strong and high level evidence to be associated with running related injuries. And then we can talk a little bit more on lower levels of evidence, even <coughs> providing anecdotal evidence regarding what types of things may or may not be involved in injuries from a rehabilitative standpoint, as well as from a preventative standpoint. So, Here's what you came for tonight, right? All the secrets to running. How to run forever, how to run pain-free, how to feel good always after running, never to suffer an injury. Maybe a little magic elix elixir of sorts, some snake oil that'll cure everything, make you recover immediately from your runs, uh, get you back and, and, and run 100 miles and hardly feel like you've done anything. Or maybe some of you are here to, to get that bounce back in your step, you know, as if you were five years old again. This is my little guy. And he's, pretty, he's pretty good off the start there. <laughs> I think he's going to have him in a few years. And as I mentioned, we're really going to try to stick to the evidence. What does the evidence show regarding factors that are associated with injury? And then talk a little bit about, from a rehabilitative standpoint, uh, what's the evidence regarding how to manage these individuals from a conservative standpoint? So, uh, first of all, let's just talk about the importance of this and running related injuries. Running business is booming. I mean, the volume of runners that have uh, taken this on as a sport, um, as a hobby, uh, as a lifestyle, has significantly increased over the past years. And so along with that, we're seeing a significant increase in running related injuries and issues. I would probably say that from a medical standpoint, we're probably lagging behind in the ability to serve this growing and demanding population. But we're really coming along, I think. Even from a physical therapist perspective, I was just down at our national meeting in New Orleans, and we're now developing more of an interest. In fact, there have been more programming at that meeting than I've ever seen before pertaining to information disseminating to therapists as far as how to manage runners specifically. I think previously, a lot of runners, at least that I've seen historically, have been very frustrated with how they were managed medically. A lot of times, often, their best advice was simply to stop running. Whereas there's a lot of things that we can do to keep you running, and there's really no evidence to strongly indicate that running is harmful to you in the long run. I think where we run into trouble is when we try to persist with it in spite of injury, which can lead to further problems and further chronicity of some of these things. So you can see the prevalence of, of injuries, and it is fairly common uh, to have some type of injury. I would imagine that pretty much everyone in this room has had an injury at some point in time that might be related to their running but where we see a lot of variation as far as injury and injury risks is related to the methodology used in the studies and how we actually define injury. So is injury just a simple ache or a pain? Does it have to surpass a certain numeric value on a pain scale? Does it have to mean that you have to be off of running to actually suffer an injury? So that's why you'll see such a huge disparity in the literature regarding rates of injury and injury risks. So, some of that we need to kind of consider the context of the situation when it pertains to the information related to running injury and running risk. So the other thing to think about is every runner is different as far as the training um, uh, that they uh, perform. So some individuals may be fairly novice. Some individuals may be putting in lots and lots of miles. Okay, and so we'll talk about uh, the injury risk that pertains to that. But sometimes these studies that look at injury risk 
it's important to look at, okay, are they novice runners? Are they experienced runners? Were they training for a fairly low mileage event or a very high mileage event? How many miles are they putting in? So all those factors seem to have an impact as far as what the injury risk or injury rate was uh, within that investigation. So you can see that a large part of the injuries related to running are in the knee, primarily. Uh, the lower extremity in general, so hip, ankle, and foot, and Achilles area. Um, we do have some injuries that occur up in the hip and the pelvis, and a few that can be even up in the torso and the, and the neck and the shoulder, but much less common. And the most common ones, as you can see there, patellofemoral pain is essentially pain of the front of your knee or around your kneecap. Okay? It's a fairly general type diagnosis. That's primarily the most common. Iliotibial band friction syndrome. I think everybody's heard about the iliotibial band. It gets a lot of, uh, a lot of notoriety in some regards. This is a disorder particularly that, again, involves the outside of the knee. Okay? Um, the iliotibial band does go up around the hip, and there can be problems there. But the friction syndrome is primarily at the knee. Um, and then if you look down to the knee meniscal injuries, again, that involves the knee. So the top five injuries, three of those are in the knee, and that contributes to the large majority of injuries in that area. So we're going to go through each of these individually, um, and primarily focusing on the risk factors that have really been shown by the evidence to be strong contributors um, as far as injury risk. But one of the things to keep in mind is that oftentimes the etiology um, or how will these injuries come about are often multifactorial. So there's not always just one thing that contributes to the injury. It wasn't just uh, the surface that you were running on. It wasn't just your running shoe. It wasn't just your mechanics. There's oftentimes multiple things that contribute to injuries. And to me that's kind of exciting because this is, this is a very complicated puzzle that you have to put together to figure out the issue. And when you do, it's very rewarding because it puts that individual back into a situation where they can do what they enjoy and what they love and what makes them who they are. So, so we're gonna start with differing levels of evidence. So strong evidence is indicated by studies that have been done that are very high quality, very rigorous methodology, okay? So you can have better confidence in the conclusions that are drawn from these studies, okay? As we go down the line to the lower levels, there's just less confidence you can put in the results from that investigation. It doesn't mean it's worthless, but you also just need to take it into context of the situation. And I would also say that's true for some of these things that are very strongly known to cause risk. Doing these things, or in a, if you fall into the category of one of these things, it doesn't mean that you're going to have an injury, most certainly, okay? It just shows that there's more of an increased probability for that to occur. So if we look down through here, high overall weekly mileage, so greater than 20 miles a week, has actually been shown to be protective. So people that put in that type of mileage actually have fewer rates of injuries, okay? But there seems to be a certain threshold to when you get above that 40 mile point that there's actually a little bit of a tendency to have more lower leg injuries. And it's mostly found more so in men than women, okay? So there's some disparities we can't entirely explain there. So, I would chalk this up to, in some regard to the fact that there's a conditioning effect when you put in, put in a certain amount of mileage. And oftentimes those people who run fewer mileage, as you'll see in some of these uh, other examples here, they may run it irregularly. So they might run 10 miles one week, they might run two miles, they might have a very irregular training schedule. And that actually has been shown to be uh, a higher rate of injury in those individuals who have this kind of unstable training volume. One of the biggest factors that contributes to running injury risk is a history of prior injury. And I think all of us would uh, kind of think that that makes, that makes sense. If you've had an injury, oftentimes most don't fully recover before they return to running, and they're more likely to suffer another injury. Um, and, um, and, and so you'll see that kind of uh, indicated there by that study by Taunton in 2003 that even 90% of individuals within that study indicated they hadn't really fully recovered when they returned to running. Uh, that potentially led, it, led to a, a, a subsequent injury. And then you can see some of the huge variation uh, in the range there, from 65 to 300 percent. I mean, uh, that comes down to the methodology we talked about previously. Okay. Some other factors. Um, pronation. Okay. Pronation, again, one of those things that gets a lot of notoriety. Um, but do notice that it's excessive pronation. Okay. Pronation in and of itself is a healthy component to how we walk and how we run, okay? It's necessary, okay? I see many individuals who don't have enough pronation, 
and that actually leads to some of their symptoms. Okay, so we're talking about excessive pronation here, um, has been shown. A high Q angle, of which I would argue that the two kind of go hand in hand. So uh, the Q angle, as seen by the picture there, is the angle um, from a certain marker in your pelvis down to your knee, and then from your knee down the lower leg, okay? And so individuals that are more knock-kneed have a higher Q angle, okay? And individuals, when you're knock-kneed, if you just do that to yourself, you'll find that you pronate, okay, and that you roll your arches in and down when you do that. So that's why the two kind of go hand-to-hand, -hand. a low arch or pronation kind of goes in concert with the Q angle, and we're seeing both of those factors actually related to uh, slightly increases in, in injury risk. Okay. And again, as we're talking about injury risk, we're really just talking about many injuries in general, I'm not pinning this down to one specific injury. Some of these studies have identified that, but we're just talking about risk in general. So the other thing that's been shown by fairly strong evidence is weight. Okay? Most of these are kind of tibial stress, which is thought to be more of an impact injury. So this is like a, a shin splint or a stress fracture of the lower leg, um, as well as spinal injuries are two to four uh, times likely when the BMI is above 21 kilograms per meter square, which, just for your reference, I'm about 175 pounds, six foot two. My BMI is about 22.5. Okay, so this is not really big people that we're talking about here. Obese individuals, I'm sorry, overweight individuals. The cutoff there is around 25, and obese is around 30. Okay, so this doesn't mean you have to be really, really big. Although there is some increasing incidence, you know, the, the larger you are. Some of that again, I would probably already comes down to a training factor. So there's more than one factor that goes into potentially increased incidence related to your, your weight, your BMI. So when it comes to pronation, this is just kind of a, a, a study just to show um, kind of the differences and the cutoff of the pronation here you can see is the black line right through the middle. And this was 47 elite female athletes, elite female runners. And you know there's only a few um, injuries that were tracked here, the shin splints and the, and the tendonitis, which are most likely and most commonly kind of associated with uh, the pronation effect, although it can cause many other things. And you can see on the right are people that have less pronation. So these are people with higher arches in general. On the left are individuals with lower arches. And so you can see out of the eight individuals that were injured, almost all of them were kind of on the lower end. Okay? But it doesn't mean on the higher end you don't have injuries as well that are related to this. Okay? And like I said, I definitely, from a clinical standpoint, do see individuals that have high arches that actually need a little more pronation. So pronation isn't all that bad, but when it's excessive, it can be a factor. So now we're getting to the things that we put less confidence in. There's weaker evidence for um, um, the fact that hip abductors, so the muscles on the sides of your hip, they're the ones that when you take a step, they lift your pelvis and keep it level without letting it drop down, which oftentimes pushes your knee in on the leg that you're on. Okay. But I will say from a clinical standpoint, we work on the hip abductors quite a bit and people get better when we do that. And there's good evidence from a treatment perspective that working on those muscles results in improvement in their symptoms. Okay? So it may not be preventative as far as injury risk, but we know from a rehabilitative standpoint that those abductors are important. Okay? The VMO is a muscle on the quad, so the front of the thigh. This, I would say, is, is fairly controversial. We've even done some investigations looking at, you know, timing differences of this muscle, which is on the inside, compared to the muscle on the outside, which is thought to contribute to this patellofemoral pain, which is your kneecap type issues. And there's one lab out of Australia that seems to find that there are issues with this and there's timing differences. But all the other labs across the country have had a difficult time in reproducing uh, the findings that, uh, that, they've, uh, uh, that they've put out. So, I would say it's very controversial. Again, from a rehabilitative standpoint, the quads are important. When we land, when we run and we land, those quads help to absorb the shock, help to allow control the knee as it bends, and they are important muscles. So um, it's something I think we definitely should take care of, but there's nothing really to say really confidently that's going to prevent you from having an injury, per se, if you work on it ahead of time. And then we talk about some of the other alignment things that we look at clinically. So static means essentially is we look at it with you not moving, okay? Um, one of the things that's important to consider um, um, as a clinician who's assessing individuals who are running in any other movement-related sport, 
typically their issues are related to their movement, okay? So if we only look at the individual when they're not moving, you know, we can sometimes miss the picture as far as what might be going on. So that's why in some regards, some of these static things that we look at may not necessarily correlate to how they're moving because that might change when they are moving. So, so things like rotation of the thigh, you know, your pelvis being unlevel, which some of that could be from a leg length discrepancy, which as you can see there, may not be that big of a deal but sometimes it can be, you know. But one thing to understand is we're not perfectly symmetrical beings. So, you know, when we look at things structurally like that and focus really on alignment, there's many other things that come into play that can contribute to injury that if we put all of our money on that, we could be missing the picture. Um, the human body in and of itself is a very complicated entity, which again makes, um, makes uh, diagnosing and treating some of these injuries more complicated, but also in the same while pretty exciting. Um, because the body has the capacity to do so many things differently and it can adapt to more than just structural things, okay? And it can make accommodations uh, in different ways um, uh, which may not have uh, result in potential for injury. And then somewhat surprising, but you know, some would put impact peaks a little bit higher up as far as the evidence. But I'll show you it here in just a minute. There's some evidence that kind of refutes this and it's not completely consistent that actually landing hard um, or having high impact peaks transmitting through your body uh, relates to injury. Although, again, I would argue that in some contexts, when we treat individuals and we reduce that, they again they, they, they do and they can get better. Um, so this just kind of shows an interesting study by Nig in 2001, and you may have run across this name. I know right now with the barefoot running popularity, um, it seems like I see his name in a lot of the articles that are being quoted recently. He's done a lot of great work looking at the ankle and foot, uh, particularly in runners, um, as well as some other things relating to injury risk. But in this study, they looked at impact peaks. So they looked at when an individual lands, okay, what is the force that impacts the body as a result of the foot hitting the ground, okay? So the graph on the left is the peak, okay? So when your foot hits the ground, what's the highest peak of that impact related to your body hitting the ground? And you can see there that the injury frequency is on the y-axis, so going up and down. And you can see that the individual that had the highest injury were the individuals that had the lowest peaks, okay? Which doesn't make sense, right? Those are the people that had the lowest impact, okay? So remember, the human body is pretty amazing. There's more that the body can do to, to kind of dissipate these forces that may not necessarily relate to injury. Okay, so simply just looking at impact peaks isn't the whole picture. We need to consider other factors that contribute. The same, similar trend is noted if you look at the graph on the right, which now is not just looking at peak. Another thing that's commonly thought to be problematic is not just how high does the peak get, but how fast you get to the peak. Okay, so do you load up to that rate pretty slowly, or do you load up to there really fast? And the thought is a lot of times when you load it really fast, that's going to be more problematic. And again, as you see there, those who... Um, have a higher loading rate, okay? Um, well, in this case, I'm sorry, in this case we do see those with a higher loading rate actually had um, uh, reduced frequency of injury, okay? So what I'm getting at is loading rate may be a little bit more of a factor that might make sense rather than just pure impacts in general, okay? So sorry about the confusion there. So high impacts um, didn't necessarily seem, in general, didn't necessarily seem to be related to injury, but maybe the speed, okay, to get that impact um, is more, uh, more contributory. Okay, so now we're getting some things that are inconclusive. And these are things that it seems like, from what I see in, in some of the literature, magazines and journals, and kind of discussed uh, as well. Um, welcome, guys. Um, yeah. um, but one of the first things is running experience and age. Okay, so we're, not, we're seeing some studies that some will find fewer injury risk in those who are of more running experience. But we also see some that are fairly high quality that find that it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. And we see uh, equivalent uh, uh, levels of injury in those who have, are experienced runners versus those who are novice runners. Um, age as well. So again, this kind of refutes the phenomena uh, or what you commonly hear that, you know, if you run over time and time, they're going to have a higher um, injury risk. And, and of course, over time, you're going to get older. So we would expect the injury rate to increase as you age. But we don't necessarily see that with the studies right now. We see some studies that show that, some studies that don't. Okay, So we're really not sure uh, as far as that association. Um, stretching and flexibility. All right, This is, a, this is kind of an area of, of big controversy um, and much debate. 
Um, we do find some interesting factors here regarding stretching and flexibility. Um, again, I would say it might be different as far as injury risk, but from a rehabilitative standpoint, we do find that when we address flexibility issues and we instruct individuals in stretching, those runners tend to recover from the injury. Okay, so there seems to be some impact as far as treatment, but as far as can you preventatively reduce your injury just by stretching, that could be a little less conclusive in that regard. But some of the studies there, as I, I pointed out here, kind of indicate that those who might be more flexible or less flexible might be the ones that are having higher risk. And those who are kind of average flexibility kind of have lower risk. And so it, in the end, it's kind of a wash, okay? They kind of cancel each other out. So you're really finding that flexibility doesn't seem to make a difference. But if you're on either end of the spectrum, if you're overly flexible or underly flexible, that may contribute more so, okay? So uh, I think if we were to break that down into subgroups and look at injury risk in those people who are much less flexible in general and identify that beforehand, we might have different results as far as you know, a preventative risk of those who might be less flexible. Okay? But we've yet to show that. Train is another one, and I'll, I'll show you a few graphs about this. Um, oftentimes people say they, they feel better when they run on grass or softer surfaces and hitting the pavement uh, makes them hurt more. Um, but we'll show you some interesting things, again, that demonstrates the complexity of the human body and how it can actually respond differently regardless of the terrain. Um, footwear, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then another thing that I think is an interesting area that hopefully we'll see some more literature about this is the functional movement screen. So I've already talked about the limitations regarding assessing runners from a static posture, so looking at them when they're not moving, when their sport, when their function is actually running in a movement-related function. The functional movement screen is a clinical examination that is based upon movement, okay? And it's a series of seven different tests that can be graded based on your quality of movement. And there have been some studies that have identified that there are higher risk when you get a score of 14 or below. This functional movement screen was first actually studied on professional football players, and it showed with pretty high accuracy that it could predict those individuals who were going to have an injury that season. And we're starting to see this pan out now in other populations. Um, and it's again around that 14. So for the football players, it was 14 as well. Uh, the study, um, I don't have the reference quoted here, but the more recent one looked at uh, female college athletes in volleyball, basketball. Um, there's one more sport I can't remember the top of my head. But again, it kind of showed the way it played out, less than 14, those individuals had a higher risk of injury. Okay. So there's some, some potential here from which we can go out to uh, high schools and, and uh, you know, running stores and elsewhere and use this functional movement screen to kind of identify issues in runners um, and educate them on how to improve their movement quality in a manner that might reduce their running injury risk. Okay? But again, yet to be done, uh, still inconclusive on that at this point in time. So this was an interesting study done by Dixon and uh, what they looked at is what is the effect of runners on running surface? Now, they didn't have a huge sample. They only had six subjects here, but it does kind of point out the variability between runners. Every runner is not the same from the next, and that's why we need to look at every runner as an individual and not put everyone together and say, okay, these are the things that we always need to do across the board, okay? So on the left, asphalt is the harder surface. On the right, modified is the softest surface, okay? So you're seeing hard, kind of medium, and then a softer surface. And they looked at the loading rate. So this was the factor that we looked at before that kind of seemed like it was related to injury risks. So that's how fast you load up to that peak. Okay, so if it occurs really fast, you're really loading it fast and hard. And as you can see, what you would think is if, if the running surface decreased that peak, and if that peak relates to injury risk, we would see then that the peaks would be lower as you went to the right. Okay. And there is a somewhat of a general trend there, but you'll see a couple of individuals that kind of buck the system here. And you actually see, for example, on this one, you'll see that actually on the softer surface, they had the highest loading rates. Okay? And there's a couple of individuals that have a similar trend in that way. And so there's just a lot of variability that simply just assessing running terrain may not be the whole picture. Okay? It may be a part of it, though. So we do need to consider that. But we can't say at this point in time, you know what, everybody should always run on softer surfaces. Okay. The body has an amazing ability to, to adapt and to make accommodations that can account for that. And in some individuals, it actually reduces their loading rate okay, on a harder surface. So now comes the, the question I think we all pose at some point in time, you know, at, at what point should I get this looked at? Okay. Is this bad enough that I should probably have this um, 
looked at by a medical professional. And there's a lot of factors that come in here, and I can't tell you, you know, for sure when you should. You know, even personally, you know, I deal with running-related injuries. Many of you do as well. A lot of times they kind of go away, don't they? You know, you wait it out a little bit, they go away. But sometimes they don't. And when they don't, and they last for a long enough period of time, typically from what we know of other regions of the body, okay, and in other patient populations, those individuals are harder to kind of fix. Okay, it takes longer to recover, and sometimes their symptoms turn into more chronic symptoms that are much harder to overcome and to get back to sport. So, um, I would say in general, you know, once you know it's a problem, and once you know or are pretty certain that it's not going away on its own, you know, the sooner you get in, the better. Okay. And these are oftentimes things that you do need someone from a medical perspective and a rehabilitative perspective to kind of put these pieces together to find out what's going on. Because as we've already discussed, you know, the body is pretty complex and, 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 and can do a lot of things um, in, in kind of quirky ways. And you may need someone with a little bit more of a background to kind of understand that, to put the pieces together for you, to identify what's going on and develop a plan to have you overcome that injury. So we're going to get into treatment a little bit, and I've already alluded to this as well, but I think what's important to understand is when we're evaluating runners, we need to be looking at their movement, okay, if it particularly is something that's movement related. Now sometimes uh, runners have injuries that oftentimes are easy to identify through just simply the physical examination, okay, but if it's not, you know, if we can't provoke the symptoms in the exam, we can't really draw what's going on, our treatment may not seem to be making sense and making improvements then we need to kind of analyze the runner. Um, in analyzing the runner, our eyes cannot capture movement fast enough to really tell you everything, okay? Um, if you watch runners enough, you can kind of get a sense for some things that are really obvious, but really when it comes down to the details, you have to slow it down. Um, we use a camcorder that can capture up to 240 frames a second. Our eyes capture at 16 frames a second, okay? Most standard camcorders do about 30 frames a second. And standard camcorders usually work pretty well for the most part. But sometimes, especially when you're looking down at the foot, slowing it down much more than 60 or even 30 frames a second is, is, is needed, essentially. So um, it's not a piece of equipment that's real expensive. Um, I talked with a colleague recently, and they've got a camcorder now that costs $300 that can capture up to 1,000 frames a second. So um, that's kind of exciting. And so Carrie, if you've got money in the budget, mm -hmm. you to get one of those. Um, so again, it's, it's not an expensive piece of equipment, you know, um, so it's okay to ask your, your healthcare professional, you know, if they're not looking at your running and you don't feel like you're getting the answers, say, you know, you know, hey, would it be worthwhile? Just kind of plug that idea in their head, worthwhile to kind of watch me run, you know, um, it shouldn't be that hard to get a camcorder in and slow it down and take a look at it. Um, it does take a little bit of a training, though, as far as knowing how to interpret it. So uh, that's another thing to consider as well. I will say, though, that in general, there are more and more of us out there that have running clinics like ours. Um, individuals who have experience, whether it be personal as well as just professional, in treating runners. Okay, so if, if you're finding that your healthcare professional doesn't seem to relate, um, you know there are individuals that are out there, um, and, and who can serve you uh, in the manner that you, that you require. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment, and again, we're going to kind of focus on what the evidence tells us. Um, you know, there's a lot of experts out there who can provide some information on treatment um, anecdotally, um, but again, on a case-by-case -case basis, that can be important and relevant, um, but when we're speaking more generally here, we want to stick to, to the facts. Um, one thing I think that's uh, important to note is that when we look at the evidence relating to runners and running injury, it's not real expansive. Again, this is an area that I think is growing. We're seeing much greater interest, particularly in our profession as well, in looking at some of these things, because runners really are of a different breed in some regards. And I would say a lot of that comes from a psychosocial perspective. Um, uh, and this uh, picture kind of nicely depicts some of the stubbornness that I think a lot of times is the mentality of a runner, myself included, so I don't want to be calling no one out. And the fact that oftentimes, you know, running is our passion to the extent that a little injury isn't going to hold us down, and we're going to keep kind of pushing through that. But it does tend to cause problems in these injuries becoming more chronic and then harder to deal with and causing more problems down the road. So. Um, I don't think that some of the literature that we have now that provides evidence as far as how to manage, you know, knee conditions, how to manage heel pain, and how to manage these common knee pain conditions, which happen in people that are not runners, the evidence we have now pertains to just general individuals. It's not quite as specific to runners. Okay, and so hopefully the evidence as we see coming out here 
we'll be more specific to runners and we'll have more answers as far as the best ways to manage that, which may be different uh, from our general um, outpatient orthopedic population. So again, we're going to talk pretty generally about treatment, um, and particularly I'm going to talk from my expertise, which is a, from a rehabilitative uh, standpoint, uh, from a physical therapy standpoint. But I would argue that I think running and a lot of these movement-related disorders are very, um, um, are very um, uh, appropriate for a PT because movement is kind of our expertise. Okay, uh, so when it comes to issues that are relating to movement, movement-related um, uh, functions, movement-related sports, um, which all of them are, um, I'd say PTs are, are, are in a good area to, to manage these conditions. But first of all, if we're seeing an individual um, straight off the street, it's important to rule out medical conditions. Okay, if there's other things going on. Uh, from a, a cardiovascular perspective, um, even considering some other factors, um, um, you know, uh, such as the female triad, which um, considers uh, some nutritional deficits as well as some uh, uh, bone-related uh, uh, deficits. You know, those are things that we need to get them in the appropriate um, healthcare provider's door so they can have that further examined and managed from a more medical standpoint. Generally speaking, oftentimes when we manage conditions, um, we use this. EDUARC model, and this stands for education first, okay, so when we see an injury, especially if it's fairly fresh, educate the individual about the injury, what's going on, what might have contributed to that injury, um, and then we unload the area, okay, so oftentimes we have to take the stress off a little bit in some way, shape, or form, and we'll talk about some of the ways in which we can do that, and yes, sometimes that does mean rest, but no, not always, so it just kind of depends on how severe, kind of what stage you are in the injury, um, and how much running is affecting that and its ability to recover. Okay. And then from there we start to reload. So as we work on the individual and we get them to a point to where they can start tolerate running again, we start to reload things gradually. And gradually is very important from that perspective because oftentimes problems recur because we don't condition the body after that period of rest. Okay. We take three months off, all my pain's gone, I go back to running 20 miles a week that next week. And then all of a sudden the pain's back and not sure why. So some of that's just the fact that, okay, your body wasn't conditioned for 20 miles because it had three months off, but if we started a little bit slower, it would have built itself back up to that point, and maybe that injury wouldn't have come back. So the, the tools and the things that we use, you know, exercise is a big part of what we do. So we've talked about some of the risk factors, and not all of them really relate to these things such as strengthening and these things such as flexibility. But again, when you look at the evidence as far as treating conditions, those interventions are successful. Exercise is a very successful intervention in recovering from injury. Okay. as well as even preventing recurrence of injury, I would argue, as well. There's some very good studies on, on, on the low back, particularly, that demonstrate that when you strengthen around that core, there's much lower rates of recurrence. Okay. Another thing we do is we use our hands. Okay. So physical therapists are skilled in using our hands to manipulate, to mobilize, to work on tissues, joints, uh, even the, uh, the neurodynamic uh, components, which can contribute to injuries and pain. Um, and some of this requires instrumentation, some of this requires our hands. Okay? And so kind of working on those tissues that have been injured, finding what stage you're in, and bringing them back to a state to which we can load them again with running and get you back to the sport. Modalities, fairly controversial this time, but for the most part it's really kind of falling out of favor as far as if this really is contributing to overall improvement. When I talk about modalities, I'm not talking about ice. Ice is pretty important. When you're injured, you know, use ice, and, and that's a, a fairly good piece of advice. But we're talking about use of ultrasound, iontophoresis, which is using an electric current to kind of push an anti-inflammatory into the area. And in some cases, you know, maybe on an elite athlete level or kind of in a training room, some of those modalities, they may give a little edge, and some of that actually might be more the placebo effect than anything. So there may be some situations where that might be appropriate, but really all in all, most of the studies that have looked at adding a modality on top of the traditional treatment, which is manual therapy and exercise, it doesn't seem to add that much more. Okay, the patients seem to still get better without it. Um, so, you know, would you rather spend your time, you know, rubbing a magic wand uh, or putting a patch on, or can you make better use of your time using your hands or doing the exercise and committing to those types of things? So, um, the other thing, and we'll show some examples of this, is retraining. Okay, um, oftentimes when you kind of correct the dysfunction in the tissues, okay, you allow them to to, to heal. Um, <laughs> and you kind of teach them how to maybe move differently if you identified some issues in their movement patterns and you just kind of place that person back on on the track and they can run just fine and they don't have problems 
Sometimes, though, we need to do some retraining as far as, okay, well, everything seems to work fine outside of when you run, but when you run, we're still seeing some things that are potentially contributing to these issues. And so sometimes we have to work within the context of running to retrain that individual. And we'll show you some ways in which we can do that. And the other thing that's very important, I already alluded to, is the return to running program. And it has to be very gradual. It has to be appropriate based upon your level of prior training, how long you were out, um, as well as kind of the nature of the injury as well. So there's a lot of factors that go into there. But I will say that typically starting slower and working up gradually is usually better. And where most people run into problems is trying to get back into things too soon. So if you don't have a particular event that you're really getting up to and it's just kind of getting back into it, you know, do it much slower than you normally would. Okay, and you're usually going to be better off. And then we'll talk a little bit about shoe recommendations. Uh, this kind of gets pretty anecdotal, but there's some evidence to, to steer us in the right direction as far as who's going to benefit from, from these types of things. So I won't spend a whole lot of time about this, but to me this is kind of some exciting work that's coming out of the East Coast here where they're looking at uh, just taking people with pain and they do the examination. They really don't do any treatment. They just put them on the treadmill and they look at their mechanics and they make them correct their mechanics. Okay. So in this case, what they're doing is they're using 3, 3D motion analysis. So you heard Kerry kind of mention our human performance lab. Our human performance lab is a three-dimensional motion analysis laboratory. So essentially, through the markers, you can see the precise angles that each joint moves, and you can calculate the graphs in degrees okay, across that movement. Okay? So the graphs that we get essentially look like this, and this is when the, the heel first hits the ground, this is when the foot comes off the ground. Okay, in this case it's the hip, so as soon as the hip lands, it goes through movement, it rotates, rotates outward, rotates inward, then rotates back outward again. And you can see that graphed on here. And what they did, to me this picture isn't quite as clear, um, because actually they took it from an angle, which actually introduces some error, but anyway. In this case, they, they claim the individual, their knee was kind of going in. Okay, so their thigh was rotating into what we call internal rotation. And so what they did is they trained them, and they had them watch that graph. And every time they ran, they had to move their line to meet a goal that was set for them to rotate their thigh out. Um, and in actually, in this case, this is an individual with, with knee pain, okay, one of the highest categories we saw of injury. And this individual did recover simply by doing this retraining, and they gave them this feedback, which they tapered over time. So they watched the screen a lot at first, and they said, okay, here's your line. Uh, the solid line is pre, the dotted line is post. So they said, okay, here's where you are now. Here's where I want you to be. Every time you run, you have to, you have to, put your, you have to move your body such that you, you end up on that line. And then they, they decreased that feedback over time. So they took it away from them. They gave it back. They took it away so that eventually they learned. And they retained it. And actually months after when they followed up, they had actually maintained this shift from that retraining. Okay, so it's kind of a different approach to running, uh, I'm sorry, to running rehabilitation that I think is exciting. We still need much more investigation on it. The other thing that we need is there are very few labs that, that or very few clinics that have motion analysis labs. So do we really need all this high technology to accomplish this? Or maybe can we use something a little bit simpler like a mirror? Okay, and we're starting to find out, again, out of the same lab, that you can do that. So oftentimes you can take the runner and just put them in front of a mirror and say, hey, do you see your knee going in on that side? Well, let's keep them apart a little bit more, or don't let your feet roll in a little more, or you know you can give them some cues, and they can learn just by simply watching themselves in the mirror. So, uh, this was something that was recently presented at a meeting I just spoke about just uh, a month ago, um, and it did show that interesting here. They actually assessed their cue angle. So we talked about that before already. That was kind of shown to be a risk of injury, and they actually showed that by just simply using a mirror, using the same type of feedback, and pulling it away that they could actually reduce this cue angle um, and again the, the individuals got better um, and it uses something that's simple that can be um, performed in any rehabilitative clinic. Another thing that I use quite a bit actually based on some recent uh, um, uh, uh, some recent information uh, out of a lab in Wisconsin is simply just looking at step rate. Okay, So when we run, we run at a certain rate. Okay. Typically, it's between 145 to 160 steps per minute. Um, some would say ideal is around 180. So you can imagine if you take fewer steps when you're running, you're likely taking a little bit longer strides and steps. And when you increase that step rate and take fewer steps, okay, your turnover is a lot faster. Your feet are kind of coming in closer to you. And that's actually what they found in this study. So they found that, okay, when I took somebody and I had them just run at their normal pace and their normal step rate and assessed it, 
and then told them, okay, I want you to run 10% faster. And you can take a metronome and you can pace them like that. And that's oftentimes what I do is just take a metronome and, and you can pace them 10% further. Okay, does that decrease your pain? Yeah, okay, great, that's what you're gonna do. And they may just do that during the time to which they recover. And when they do, you may just tell them, okay, if you like that step rate, it feels comfortable, stick with it. Um, but there is some evidence to indicate that oftentimes when you change that step rate, you lose a little efficiency. So they may wanna just revert back to their preferred uh, step rate, which is fine. Um, but they've overcome that injury and they potentially can reload it at that time. So it kind of gives you a window of opportunity and a way from which you can retrain them. Um, and it does actually change the mechanics. And we'll talk about this when we get to barefoot running. It kind of converts you to more of the pattern which we see in barefoot runners, which is the toe starts to point down more and you land more through the midfoot or the forefoot. And then we're also seeing um, a little bit different type of flex in the knee and excursion of the pelvis. When you do that, and I'll show you some videos in just a little bit that'll kind of demonstrate that difference. So, nice and easy thing. Uh, you know, if you're having pain, you can simply increase that step rate, and oftentimes uh, it'll help alleviate the injury at least temporarily. Does anybody remember these commercials? I hope I'm not dating myself too much. So I would say, even though it's related to basketball, I would say that, that shoes are, are pretty popular regarding running in, a, in an area of huge debate. So we're not going to tackle this in, in entirety. There we go. But I do want to present a little information that might kind of change the way you think when you go out and you look and, and you purchase shoes. Right now, a lot of the theory behind footwear and shoes is very biomechanical in nature. Okay, we've already talked about some of the factors biomechanically, so that's alignment type stuff that may or may not relate to injury risk, and again, may or may not relate to even recovery from injury. But really, our shoes are kind of based on that. So you'll see this is from a, a shoe manufacturer that kind of says, okay, you need a cushion shoe if you've got this high arch, you need a stability shoe if you're kind of somewhere in the middle, and then you need this motion control shoe if you're one of those flat-footed, you know, pronator type persons uh, that's really, really bad, right? Um, but, you know, interestingly, when we look at a study that, that looked at um, taking these three different types of footwear and really trying to pan it, okay, does it, does it really make a difference? If we put someone in a, that has a high arch and a high arch shoe, are they going to have fewer injuries, right? Because that's what we would think. And if we put someone with a really low arch in a shoe for a high arch, oh, that's asking for trouble, right? Mm -hmm. But when we look at the, basically how the study was designed is they took individuals who were training for a, uh, an event and they followed them over 13 weeks. But at the beginning, they took them and they measured their foot structure and they put them into those categories. Okay, you've got a high arch, you've got a, a neutral foot, and then you've got a low arch. But then what they did is they gave them a random shoe, okay? So some people with a high arch got a motion control shoe, some of them got the, uh, a shoe made for a high arch, and some of them got kind of more of the stability shoe, and then vice versa for all the other categories. So what they ended up with is they ended up with some individuals that seemed matched to the shoe condition, and some individuals that weren't matched at all. And so when we look at the results, one of the general trends at first that we see is that overall there seem to be more injuries regardless of their foot type in the motion control shoe, okay? So a motion control shoe is a much stiffer and kind of a straighter last, a straighter shoe. And so potentially this could allude to some of the, the things we pointed about as far as impact, that maybe, you know, they might have a little more impact. We don't know that, but it does seem though that when, when they're in that stiffer, more motion control shoe, regardless of your foot type, even if you are somebody who is flat footed, who's supposed to be in that shoe, right? Um, you can see that people that were highly pronated that had the, the, the motion control shoe, all of them had an injury, okay? Whereas if they had a flat foot and they were put into, and we're still looking at this one here, and they were put into a shoe that's a neutral shoe, so that's a shoe that's made for somebody with a high arch, so they got a flat foot, but they're putting a shoe for a high arch, they even had fewer injuries though. So that doesn't make sense, right? So money, I don't know if it's all about the shoes, okay? So, and maybe we don't need to use this biomechanical model, there's other things that we need to consider uh, when it comes to, you know, um, wearing a shoe. And the general consensus, you know, in the individuals that I work with, and this is, again, fairly anecdotal, and we need more studies about this. I usually tend to, to provide the advice of kind of finding a good running shore where they'll kind of look at you and they'll fit you with shoes and they've got lots of shoes there. Try on ones, you know, within a few categories of what you are. So you've got a neutral, neutral, I'm sorry, a neutral foot, 
I would probably push you towards a stability or maybe a cushion shoe and just try a bunch of them on and go with which one feels the most comfortable. I know that seems very unscientific, but it seems to be that what makes the most sense at this point in time and just anecdotally what we seem to have the most success with. Okay? And if you can at all kind of maybe steer away from some of those motion control shoes that are really rigid. But having said that, again, if you're in that, that category where maybe you are flat footed and you try on that motion control shoe and it does feel the best for you, it still might be a consideration. So it's not absolute by any means. Okay. We're going to kind of brush through this a little bit, but I think there's some interesting things to consider regarding shoes and looking at some of the different trends here. Um, you know, barefoot running, minimalistic shoes, which are ultra flexible shoes. And having said that, I think this is another interesting thing that kind of challenges our common and current paradigm when it comes to treatment, as well as just even shoe selection. So, um, Many people, I'm sure there are a few people in here, um, you know, 17% or so, that have had pain on the bottom of their foot around their heel, okay? Oftentimes, when you have pain like that, the common solution and strategy at first is oftentimes to support it, okay? So we might tape it, which, again, I would say is appropriate, and we might tell you, okay, you need more of a stability shoe, you need something with a little more motion control. Well, this study actually looked at that, and they said, well, let's, let's um, take these people with heel pain, let's give them the same exercise program, let's give them a rehab program that typically therapists do, each of them gets, gets that rehab program. But in one group, we're going to have them start their running, again, in an ultra-flexible shoe. Okay, so this is one with very little support, thought to maybe you know, increase the, the use of the, the bottom of the foot and the foot intrinsics. And the other group, we're going to give them those stability and those neutral type shoes. We're going to kind of give them the shoes that maybe might fit best for them um, you know, based on their foot type and kind of staying away from those motion control shoes. And what they found is they did follow-ups then as far as their pain, so their heel pain, how did it do at the midpoint, which is six weeks, and at the end of the study, which is 12 weeks? And they actually found the individuals in the ultra-flexible shoe, so the one with less support, less stability, they actually got better faster, okay? There were significant differences at those two time frames, six weeks and 12 weeks. In the end, there really wasn't a difference between the groups statistically, but as you can see there, there's still that trend to where the individuals in that ultra-flexible shoe did a little bit better, okay? So maybe it's not all about you know, having that stability when you have heel pain. And I'm going to come down, I'm just going to touch on, on, on this one real quick because I think it does apply along the lines here and then we'll come back to the barefoot stuff. But the same kind of applies to um, orthosis. Um, what this study did is it kind of looked at, again, individuals with, with heel pain and um, put them into a, a, a few different selections that are commonly done. They put them in. Uh, just a category where they didn't receive any type of orthotic. They took some and they just gave them a little gel insert, like shown here on the picture. Other individuals got a custom orthotic. So these are the two $300 orthotics that are, that are fit by a podiatrist. Um, Therapists will do that as well too. Um, custom to that individual. They put a rubber insert and then a felt insert as well. And what they tended to find out that actually if you look at the custom, uh, their response was the lowest out of all of them. So based on alignment issues, and this orthotic, the support type theory, it didn't seem to pan out that actually you could just take something off the shelf, you could actually just take a little cushion and those actually people responded better to just doing that, okay? So again, it may not all be about biomechanics. It's a part of it, but we need to consider other things when we're managing running injuries, and I would even argue foot and ankle injuries in general. A, a kind of a pragmatic approach to assessing if somebody needs an orthotic, is to utilize some taping first. Um, and this is kind of a study done by a therapist out of Australia where they, they kind of propose this. This is not an investigation, this is just a proposal, but just to kind of put that out there that, you know, the tape doesn't cost much, you can do a quick trial and see if somebody responds. I, I tend to use this and it tends to be quite successful oftentimes. Sometimes we get to the point to where if we just tape them for a little while, a week or so, they can kind of overcome that initial phase where we need to unload it and we can start loading it again and we don't need that orthotic or anything else at that time. Okay. Some things take a little bit longer and it kind of becomes cumbersome taking them all the time, so we might consider an orthotic at that point for more of a long-term solution. But I think one thing to understand is taping, in my opinion, in orthotics um, are fairly short-term uh, solutions uh, for most. Okay. There are some individuals that need those long-term, but a lot of times if you can you know, um, restore yourself to kind of the foot's natural mechanics, uh, natural function, you can potentially not have to require those indefinitely. Okay, so is anybody interested in, in going over the barefoot stuff? We can breeze through this if you're not, but yeah, okay. And we're still going to breeze through it a little bit anyway, but 
Um, so there's a, there's a huge trend as far as barefoot running, and there's a lot that we don't know, but it sparked enough interest that we're starting to see some evidence and some research coming out. So um, a partial collaboration out of this lab we talked about out east, um, and uh, Lieberman uh, et al. here uh, came out just uh, last year in January. We have looked at now, you know, what are the what are the differences in people that run barefoot? And we're talking not just about somebody uh, in the states that just started running barefoot. We're talking about people that are habitually not wearing shoes running and playing in the dirt and doing things constantly not wearing shoes and comparing them to individuals in, within the same culture that do wear shoes and looking at both of them both with shoes on with shoes off okay and what we find here is that it does change your mechanics uh, and and uh, it makes sense when you run with shoes on you tend to land more on your heel okay uh, about 80 percent of runners tend to have more of a rear foot strike pattern anyway and that's normal you know we could talk about this from an anthropological anthropological perspective that potentially um, you know footwear is what's contributed to our current patterns of movement to, to some degree um, and even shod, more shod societies is contributing to this as well but what we do see is you tend to land more on your on your heel and then we see this what we call a transient heel strike there's more of a kind of a spike kind of that loading rate is a little bit higher right at first because our foot is landing out in front of our body more okay so there's more of a spike more of a peak there whereas when you when you're barefoot, you tend to land more on your toes to kind of absorb that shock. You know, if you've ever run barefoot and you'd land on your heels, it's not very comfortable. Okay, so you tend to adapt, you tend to bring your feet underneath your body more and land more on your on your forefoot. So there is a definite change in your mechanics. And if you remember when we talked about step rate modification, that's similar to what the change that it made. It made you point your, your foot more, bring your foot underneath of your body more, and land more on the balls of your feet when you actually increase the step rate. And it doesn't have to be much. We increased it by 10% uh, in that study. So they, these are actually the, um, the samples. These are available online from this study. Okay, So these are the individuals. The individual on the left you can see in, in kind of a bad shadow. But you see landing on, on the forefoot. The individual on the right landing on the, uh, on the heel. And I'll play this back again. And we'll, uh, we'll stop it at the point of strike. And you'll see landing of the foot underneath of the body more so on the one on the left and then definitely landing on the heel stop there, stop there. okay so you can see where the foot is relative to the body here and runners with shoes okay and you can see that when they're not wearing shoes pointing down the foot is much more underneath your um, base of support okay or your center of gravity Okay. Now, there's a lot of questions to be had. So it does change your mechanics. I think we're pretty certain of that. There's a few studies that have alluded to the fact, actually very few, that maybe it could be preventative, um, but we, we don't know that at all. It's, it, you can't even make that assumption at this point in time. So we still don't know that. We need to kind of uh, assess that. I think the big thing that we're dealing with right now is with people making this conversion. Um, obviously, there's some people that make that conversion and do pretty well. There's some people that really get hurt doing this. So we don't know yet what factors predict positive response to making this transition. So who, how can we take people off the street and know, okay, based on your characteristics, you're going to do well when you convert to, to going barefoot if you so desire, versus, you know what, you're looking for trouble if you do this. So we don't know those factors yet. It would be interesting to, to know and to identify. And then what are the parameters for trans transition? So how fast can you load uh, and, and stay uh, injury free? So I think we're kind of close on time here. So. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to go uh, to the end here and, and then open it up to questions. But in general, I think um, what I'd like to point out is there are a few factors that we've shown that have been associated with risk for suffering a running-related injury. Okay, There are many things that we don't know yet. Uh, and the other thing to consider is that oftentimes running-related injuries are multifactorial. Okay, So you've got to be able to look at the, the, the picture. Oftentimes you do need a clinician specializing in this to help you out to kind of put those pieces together. To identify what's going on and develop a plan for how you can recover from this and kind of get back to running. But I would say more often than not, the solution is that you will be able to overcome that, especially the sooner you get in and, 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 and the more frequently, or the sooner you get in and get it taken care of rather than dealing with it for a longer period of time. Um, and it does take a, a unique examination that is different for people that suffer injuries that are not as movement related. Okay, so we need to look at the runner as a runner versus just someone coming in with knee pain. Okay, we need to look at them specific and do examination procedures that are specific to that 
the most or one of the more important things I would say is the analysis, the video, or even the movement type screening analysis and watching them move um, and seeing how they, the quality of their movement and how it might relate to their pain and their, their uh, function. Um, and then of course we need to reco consider your recovery status. Um, I briefly put up there uh, my return to running schedule. It's very gradual. It includes some walking and jogging together and gradually put that person back into the function so that this injury doesn't come back and we can uh, uh, prevent future recurrences. So thanks for your attention. Um, I'll answer any questions that you might have at this point. Yes, ma'am. Will ops, if you have uh, mild osteoarthritis, will running hurt or help? It's a very good question. And I would say we don't know at this point in time. Um, and I think some of that might just come down to how you respond. And so if I were to look at that in that context, I would assess how you're responding to it. Um, and if you're able to maybe change your running a little bit, you know, maybe we'll change the intervals and how you're running and things like that intensity-wise, potentially maybe changing some mechanics, potentially you could continue to run. There's nothing that says that um, it's going to increase that arthritis at this point in time. We also don't know that it won't for sure either. So we got to look at it like that. So I think that's where I kind of have to look at lower levels of evidence and it kind of come down to kind of expert opinion as far as, um, you know, uh, um, um, what the recommendations would be in that case. And unfortunately, you're probably going to see some differing opinions based on who you see. Exactly. Maybe you've already experienced that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Direction. Yep. So, yeah, unfortunately, we just don't know, uh, to be honest. Um, I guess my question was about over mileage. Because, I mean, there's the few people that do, like, ultra marathons, um, and then I've heard about the 100-mile week um, in the training program. Has, I was, has that been proven to be worthwhile, or, I mean, training at the excessive miles? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, and, and uh, from what I know, uh, I, I can't tell you, uh, I can't really tell you the answer to that. Um, we do know, again, from what we pointed earlier, it's kind of that 20 to 40 mile range that kind of showed some protective effect after 20, but maybe a little bit more after 40. But there's a lot of people that run huge miles that do fine, you know. Um, and there's some that run that and, and don't do so fine. So, yeah. so I think it's, it's definitely an area to, to look into a little further. And, and unfortunately, we, just don't, we don't have all the answers right now. So. Yes, sir. If you had to hazard a guess to the resurgence in running, what would you attribute it to? You know, that is a good question. And there's a lot of theories uh, out there, you know. Um, you know, some of, uh, some of the things you'll hear might be related to even stress, you know. Uh, for a lot of individuals, exercise is, a, uh, is a related to stress. So sometimes you'll see this surgence of running, you know, based upon, um, uh, based upon what's going on in the, in the time in that culture. And you'll, you know, some people have made some associations with that. So it could be there could be some cultural factors, socio-cultural that relates to that. You know, say economic times where you know um, uh, uh, people are stressed and maybe you know can't afford uh, to exercise in means which cost money. Running is pretty simple. It's pretty easy. You pretty much put your shoes on and you go. And it's pretty cost-effective. It's efficient. And you get a lot of bang for your buck. Your you know time management purposes. So I think that contributes to a lot of it as well. Um, and. Um, you know, potentially maybe even the, the increasing uh, awareness of health and wellness, you know, maybe contributing to some regards. You know, people know they need to do something, and again, it's an easy form of exercise for most to kind of get started in, but it's inexpensive. But, and many of you may have some, some theories on that, too, that would be equally uh, important. Is it possible uh, for a person to use their own proprioceptors in their foot to uh, be aware of their pronation or overpronation and, and change it? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a good comment, and, you know, some of these proponents of, um, of the barefoot running, that's kind of what they're relating that to in some regards, that, you know, when you, when you, when you put this foot in the shoe, uh, it kind of gets lazy in there a little bit, and so it, 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 it may be, uh, you know, doing some things adversely that might be related to the injury, and then taking that off or putting less between you and the surface allows that to function a little bit better. But, um, you know, nothing really for certain at this point that I'm aware of uh, that kind of can really support that with great confidence, um, but there may be something to that there. Yes, sir? What, what about running with a, a rod or a pin in your leg? You know, is that is that a bad thing? That makes it more challenging, doesn't it? Yeah. 
<laughs> so it really comes down to the context of where it is and, and um, you know, um, why it was there, so what was the injury. Um, you know, I'm trying to think here. If I, I can't recall many patients that I've had. Actually, I can think of one, actually, right now, recently, that does have some hardware. Um, and that individual seems to do just fine. So, again, I can't tell you with confidence, but I do know some, uh, again, uh, that one example, which individual is fine. So it really depends on the context. And I would say it comes down to, did that rod affect how you function and how you move? Which oftentimes it can and does. Okay, so you may have to make some accommodations in your running um, related to that. But again, there's more things, even from a medical standpoint, that we need to make sure it's, it's going to tolerate those impacts. So, because there's quite a bit more impact related with running uh, relative to your body weight than normal things we do on a daily basis. So, anything else? Got my email there. Feel free to, to contact me if you have questions. We've got some brochures and cards up front, so feel free to pick those up if something pops in your head later on. Um, but I appreciate your attention. Hopefully, you found some useful information here. And, um, and uh, of course, you know, you suffer injuries, I'd be more than help, happy to consult you on those at any time. So, uh, or put you in contact with someone who can help as well. So, great, thank you. Thank you.